Right, welcome to Verona Over. This week and today we have a bonus episode. Um, Grace and I thought it would be great to take the opportunity for you to get to know us a little bit better. We've had a whole bunch of incredible episodes with amazing, inspiring, insightful guests. Um, but we wanted to take the chance to give ourselves a bit of a platform for you to get to know us a little bit better. Uh, some of you will know us from our events. Some of you won't. We don't get the chance to speak to everyone, unfortunately. So today we're going to mix things up, do a totally new format. Uh, Grace and I are going to do our classic quick fire round to kick things off. And then we're going to ask each other a couple of interview questions, which are currently completely unknown. So it's a big surprise. But <laughs> who knows what's coming? <laughs> um, yeah. Hi, Grace. How are you today? Hello. Hello. Yes, it might be a bit echoey. Uh, my end. I am moving house, so I am currently in a virtually empty office, but I'm doing well, thank you. How are you? I'm good. I'm wearing my new T-shirt that Grace bought me for my birthday. Good. It's a big gay pink T-shirt, and I'm yeah very proud wearing this. I went to drag bingo last Monday we wearing it. this T-shirt and felt yeah super gay. It was great. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Man, feeling your queer oats. I love it. Yeah, I am. I'm going to drag quiz tomorrow. So there's obviously a theme within the Cup North community. Yes. <laughs> like anchored in drag. <laughs> yeah, that'll be our next event. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah, just Manchester Coffee Drag Festival. Watch this space. The world is not ready. Coffee and drag goes hand in hand. I am. Definitely. It does, yeah. I, I feel like everything in drag goes hand in hand, but maybe that reflects more on me than the truth. Mm. Mm. Okay, so Hannah, I feel like this is unfair because you actually technically have had a chance to practice these questions because you've heard them before. I normally try and wrong foot, I guess, and be like, this is going to be really serious and difficult, but are you ready to answer some quick fire questions? I'm ready. Ready? Ready. Yep. <clears throat> Right. It's a shock. What's your coffee order? So ready. Um, in my dream cafe scenario, uh, as some of you out there may know, I'm a decaf drinker okay. these days. But in my dream cafe scenario, I'm drinking a beautifully brewed, like delicious, tasty, sweet and fruity filter coffee. Uh, yeah, it's like a, a really good cafe where they just make amazing filter coffee. That's like one of my favourite things about the coffee industry is having like a really nicely brewed filter coffee because I make yeah. filter coffee at home, but I'm just a bit slapdash with it. You know, it goes in the old sage and yeah, <laughs> whatever comes out is great. So yeah, we love a sage for the convenience. Yeah. Do you <clears> like to watch them? If you go to a cafe where they do hand brew, do you like to watch them brew it? Yeah, I'm down with that. Yeah, like when we were in Birmingham and we were at, um, yeah. well, don't get me to remember names of cafes, but you know, faculty faculty that's it yeah so when, when we were at faculty yeah. and and they made a, like a really incredible coffee yeah yeah that was really good yeah 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 i think there is some like theater to a hand brew and if people mm -hmm. are happy with you watching i always love to like sneak a watch but i don't also want to be one of those like customers who's kind of hanging over the bar when you're trying very hard to get your like amounts right or your pores right <laughs> yeah don't watch so. me <laughs> I was that barista. I was like, do not watch me. Okay. So sweet and fruity filled coffee. We are in the dream cafe. As you know, what music is playing in this dream cafe? Um, that I find this question is quite a hard one. I, my ideal scenario is that I don't notice what music's playing. If, they, if, I, if I'm in a cafe and I don't okay. notice what the music is, then they have got it absolutely spot on, in my opinion. <laughs> like, the speakers are perfect, the, no, the volume's perfect, the choice of music, everything, because then I haven't noticed it, because, I, like, uh, I get really annoyed <laughs> by, like, bad speakers <laughs> and bad music choices. Yes. Uh, so that would be kind of my ideal situation. But um, I don't know, maybe something like a bit of salt in the background, you know, uh, a bit of that kind of nice. yeah, Afro beats kind of, but quiet, jazzy, yeah, soulful. That would do me. Jazzy and soulful to go mm -hmm. with your juicy and fruity coffee. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. They go hand in hand. Okay. Okay. 
Um, I also hear you on the sensory overload though. Like I'm not necessarily against music being on, but I do need to, to if I'm with someone, I hate having to be like, what are you saying? Yeah. Like leaning in and listening to them much more attentively. Okay. So this is the final question. And I think this is the hardest question. What is your best or one of your best coffee shop experiences ever? ever, ever, ever. Yeah, this is hard because um, as a member of the coffee industry, I've been to a lot of cafes and spent a lot of time there. Um, <laughs> but I think one of my most memorable is I, in a former life, worked for the SCA as an event manager. And one of our events was called Collab. And it was kind of like an event that we took around different uh-huh. European cities. It was sort of combination of talks and seminars and some like activities at cafes around the city that we were hosting in and we um got to do one in Bucharest in uh, Romania oh, wow. in 2019 I think it was which was super cool Bucharest is a very oh. cool city and one of the coffee shops there is called Bob Coffee Lab and their concept is that they do really great coffee but then they also do like an incredible kind of almost like a sig drink menu to go alongside their coffee menu so they'll have (laughs) what they did at this time I don't know where they're at these days but at this point they had like four or five different incredible like drinks that you could get um some of them were like boozy some of them weren't um a lot of sort of cold brews they were making all these like different like concoctions behind the bar and yeah and they had their bar set up with like bar stools as if you were like at a a pub almost so you could like sit at the bar and I just remember being there and they just like bent over backwards to look after us because we were there hosting this event and like I just remember everyone in Romania being like super hospitable and um yeah and that was just one of my uh, an experience I just really enjoyed I just remember being with um people from SEA and just enjoying all the drinks and yeah I do really like Bob Coffee Lab in general even when I'm not having one of their fancy drinks it's a cool space and I like their brand so So, I ticked every box from the sounds of it Mm, yeah yeah it's all got to come together hasn't it for all of those experiences like the people environment the Mm. coffee yeah 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 we found already haven't we in the process of doing this podcast that there is such a strong theme of like it's the human experience that kind of leaves the biggest mark when we ask about what's memorable. But they mm-hmm. all relate to each other, don't they? Like you can enjoy the environment a bit more if it's like appeals to your aesthetic. And then on top of that, if the people are nice, and then on top of that, if you've got a wild drinks menu, like I want to go. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sign me up. Let's go. I would love to go back. <laughs> it's quite far away though, Bucharest. I remember it taking like four yeah. hours to get there on the plane. So yeah. Uh, it's not a quick one, but mm-hmm. it's worth a trip. It's a very cool city. Yeah. yeah. Maybe they need um, extract and development there. Maybe. Maybe we need a work <laughs> trip. Yeah. Justified. <laughs> they do have a coffee festival, so, yeah. <laughs> who knows? There you go. I'm just saying. I'm Sylvia, just saying. who, who Again, hosts their coffee space, festival. Listeners. <laughs> yeah. If you're listening, Sylvia, <laughs> you heard it here. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Drop us a message. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hmm. Cool. Well, now the tables are turned and I get to flip flip the questions back on oh, you. Oh, no. <laughs> are you ready? Oh, well, my power's gone. <laughs> I'm ready. Great. I think. Okay. What is your coffee order? Um, I'm quite boring and uh, will pretty much always go for a filter and I really like being told you know like if I go over and I'm like what's good um what do I want to order uh but if I'm feeling like a bit sad or a bit tired or a bit low energy probably an oak flat white for a bit of an extra comfort nice but, yeah, filter I oh, hear you me. yeah mm-hmm. the comfort is always good <laughs> capable of making decisions <laughs> Yeah, well, sometimes it's good to have that taken out of your hands, isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, and I think it's nice. Like, as a barista, I used to really like that. Like, if people ask me, like, you know, what would you recommend? I liked that opportunity to talk about it because usually people have put time into, you know, like, curating the coffee menu. You're like, ah, oh, I could tell you what you, I would recommend, genuinely. Yeah, totally. Yeah, I love that when you're a barista and you've got, like, bits of random, like, 
filter brews on the bar and you can just like hand out like little bits of coffee to your customers and be like oh try this try that or we've got this new bag in try that like yeah I didn't miss that kind of interaction with customers me too Mm. yeah either side of it I'm happy with being the barista handing it out being the consumer receiving it (laughs) yeah the coffee I'm down (laughs) either way (laughs) great so you're sipping on your nice filter coffee that the barista's recommended what are you listening mm-hmm. to? Mm-hmm. I think this is so difficult because I also think it depends on like what you're doing in the coffee shop. Like if you're there to chat to a friend, I'm very much in your camp where I'm like, really want to hear it because I'm there to hear what my friend has to say. But if I'm there like on my own, uh, and again, maybe this is on the days where I'm, I'm drinking my sad oak flat white. <laughs> I quite like like a nostalgic sort of vibe. So anything that reminds me of my youth. Mm-hmm. Um, I was a big old emo kid back in the day. Listened to a lot of very questionable pop punk. So uh, the little cockles of my heart are always warmed if I hear like Paramore, like old school <laughs> Paramore playing. Yeah. So if I'm sad, maybe give me some pop punk from the early noughties. But don't question my taste level. Just let me let me relive my fringe days. <laughs> it's your dream cafe no one no one's judging you in your dream cafe <laughs> that's the rule <laughs> apart yeah. from me maybe well yeah i mean you can't stop, stop those kind of things can you? <laughs> external judging won't take place <laughs> uh, okay i can accept that great good good and yeah now we get to the final question what is your most memorable or one of cafe experience Yeah, you'd think I'd be better prepared to answer this question, given how many times I've already asked this of other people. Um, But I think where I'm going to land on is um, there is a coffee shop in Stratford-upon-Avon called Box Brownie, and it's run by a person called Ben, who, if anybody is listening to this podcast, if you know Ben, you will not disagree with me when I describe him as a grumpy old man. I feel like he was born a grumpy old man. Um, and I was in that like early stage of starting to think I might be interested in coffee. And I had heard through the grapevine that Box Brownie in Stratford was like the place to go. I lived in Stratford. Um, and I like bowled in. But the girl's like, maybe... 18 and I was like oh word on the street is that you're the best place for coffee and he like turned and looked at me and he's like oh yeah yeah so where have you been drinking coffee up until now and I was like cafe Nero and I have an extra shot (laughs) so basically I thought I was like a qualified coffee expert because I had four shots of coffee in my giant vat of uh, Americano and Ben laughed and just told me to sit down (laughs) oh (laughs) <laughs> um, I can't even necessarily like remember what he served me that first time. Uh, now knowing him better, I am amazed he didn't kick me out. But Box Brownie went on to be that place for me. Like I lived in Stratford. I was like a teenager. I was living on my own for the first time. And I went there like pretty much every day and got to know the staff and like they were always they were exactly those people who were like try this coffee um they worked with monsoon estates who actually exhibited at Bergen coffee festival so that was like really cool for me as well to get to meet them and they just like it was the first time I heard about coffee competition it uh, he had like a flavor wheel on the wall there and was just really open to talking about like specialty coffee even with me a total novice who like walked in with like quite a cocky attitude um just like really carved out a safe space for me at a time when I was like trying to figure out like living on my own and I still every single time I go back there will visit Box Brownie and like very much feel a lot of love and loyalty to it despite the fact that he was like (laughs) sit down (laughs) well humbling a humbling experience as well as memorable Maybe a pivotal moment in you actually being in coffee. I mean, you know, if he hadn't have done that, you know, you could yeah. have just been like, mm, I'm not, I don't know what this special exactly. coffee is about. Oh, yeah, it's not for me. So, yeah, no, you might, you've no. got Ben to thank for yeah, <laughs> however many years we've been in the yeah. industry now. Well, thank you, Ben, if you're listening. Mm. <laughs> and congratulations for keeping your cafe going yeah, for how, what is that like 10 years, 12 years? Yeah. yeah I mean that's yeah how old am I that's like 12 years ago that experience so like mm. 
yeah and I think it was maybe about four years old at that time like they've done really really well I really I remember as well that they um stopped doing loyalty cards like during that time um it was you know he owns it with his wife um and they were just really honest about like they they just couldn't afford to offer like you know that many comp drinks and things like that and Mm. the locals never held that against him because of the transparency and because of what he was creating like uh, they do loads of art there. There's a local artist called Greg McLeod. Everybody, again, who's listening, look up the McLeod brothers. They're incredible. And they do like big paintings on the wall or sell the prints. And another artist, she's moved to Scotland now, Jenna. Um, she used to do like paintings on the wall. Like it was really, it featured the local scene as well. So yeah, I'm not surprised it's still going, but I do not underestimate the massive amount of hard work that I put in, particularly mm-hmm. strapped upon Avon, like was hit hard in COVID, right? Like it's yeah. such a tourist place. <clears throat> uh, ben never really catered to tourists, though. <laughs> I mean, he would serve them, but you know, yeah. it was a local scene. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what every tourist town needs. That's what we're missing in Hebden is the cafe for the locals, oh. in my opinion. <laughs> They're all a bit tourist focused. Um, yeah. 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 It's what engenders uh, longevity and loyalty, isn't it? When it's for you. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I just edited David Rickenback's uh, podcast um, yesterday and I actually loved that conversation that we had with him just really yeah. incredible and uh, yeah. I think I said it at the time but like super useful for any cafe owners to listen to but yeah that's the one of the yeah, big totally. things that he talks about is that cafes should be tailored to the community that they're in they shouldn't just yeah, be plonked yeah. there with the kind of ego of the owner mm. like doing their own thing it has to you know recognize no. the surroundings and that's probably yeah, what Ben's done and reflect back yeah. where you are yeah 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 and uh david is also one of the nicest humans alive i feel like so there's that as well for that episode (laughs) if you haven't listened to it already yeah what a lovely person i know what very yeah so sweet lovely Mm. cool well that didn't feel too hard but it wasn't very quick fire (laughs) no yes 10 minutes later (laughs) it's like we are we're breaking all the rules we are more quick fire with our guests yeah <laughs> we're like chop chop what drink are you having okay lovely what music's playing lovely okay moving on moving on <laughs> yeah. uh, cool. it's gonna be a all task right. for you to edit this episode sorry Anna. it's gonna be uh two hours long <laughs> uh well wonderful so um who's going first who's gonna start digging in (laughs) well i have just answered a series of questions so i am happy to go first but if you are feeling like you want to stay on the role of question master i'm also happy to answer them you go Uh, you 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 tell me you go for it yeah maybe we'll do like one each or something okay okay one each okay uh okay so for reference listeners uh Hannah tasked me with coming up with three questions for this and my list was very long I have managed to get it down to four but we'll see which ones we end up asking but I think as a good starting point right totally neutral we're moving out of the world of coffee or are we my question to you Hannah is in a world where you are given the opportunity to travel in time but you can only travel in one direction so you can go forwards in time and you can come back to present or you can go back in time and come back to present. Which direction of time travel are you choosing and why? Uh, um, oh, that's a really tough question. I'm almost definitely going backwards. Um, do you okay. want to know when, where I'm going? <laughs> um, I think feel, I... feel, free, feel free to colour your answer how you see fit. Yeah. Oh, I... I love the music from the 70s and there's so many artists that I just Mm -hmm. wish so much that I had the chance to see live. So, yeah, if I could go back to the 70s, I I quite like 70s, like clothes and TV. Um, I just like 70s stuff. And my mum was like a kid of the 70s as well. So I think I feel like that connection with her. And yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously there were some, like, bad things going down in the 70s as well, which, you know, but there's always bad mm-hmm. things going down. And whilst 
feminism has yeah. come on a bit <laughs> in the past 50 years. Um, yeah, I, I don't feel like going to the future um, because the patriarchy will be toppled by then is a realistic expectation. So, uh, yeah, I'm going back to the 70s. <laughs> nice, nice. I don't know why, but I thought you would go back. Mm. Uh, yeah, the seventies is news to me, but it makes sense. Yeah, music, music of decades past. Yes. Yeah. Uh, cool. Good answer. Well, my first question is a little bit more personal to you. <laughs> um, if you don't want to answer oh, it, then we don't have to talk <laughs> about it. <laughs> Misunderstood the assignment. So, <laughs> well, it's just an interview, okay. I suppose. <clears throat> I just thought of like an interview question. Um, I wanted to ask you about your recent walk for Endo. You've just spent one month walking yeah. 8,000 steps. Is it 8,000? Yeah, 8,000 steps was, every day. 8,000 a day, yeah. Yeah, which, yeah. given that we just delivered a coffee festival in the past few weeks, uh, I think is a pretty incredible feat. Congratulations for completing the challenge. Oh, thank you. Thank you. And <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to ask you about it, like what your motivation for doing it was and like, was it hard? Did you find it doable? Like what were the challenges? <laughs> yeah. Oh, this is a lovely question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, and Thank you also uh, for like putting the shout out about it on the Cut North Instagram that really touched me. Um, mm. Endometriosis is a disease that, according to current statistics, affects one in 10 uh, in the UK. And despite that fact, it takes an average of eight years to receive a diagnosis. And that's just the diagnosis. So that's where the eight for 8,000 steps came from. It is, I mean, medical professionals who are listening to this will probably like balk at my lowbrow <laughs> definition of it. But essentially, it's when endometrial tissue, so tissue that belongs sort of in your womb and your uterus, moves to places it shouldn't be. And this can cause like really horrible uh, periods. They can be really long, really painful. It can cause infertility. And we know anyway, as people who have periods, that periods are, are difficult. It can really like, mess with your hormones your energy levels so it's a really far-reaching disease when it is a problem on top of that endometriosis and in my lucky case uh, my endometrial tissue also migrated to my diaphragm which is quite rare uh, and that means that well it meant back when I had a period in those bonny days that I'd have like frickling shoulder pain and I wouldn't be able to take a full breath and in really extreme cases of diaphragmatic or thoracic endometriosis, it can mean that you can have like lung collapse if you menstruate. So really quite serious. Um, yeah. My surgeon told me that it can also, it can migrate to like your esophagus, so you can't swallow food, it can go in your brain. Like Gosh. it really is this concept, like misconception that endometriosis is like a period problem. Uh, whereas I would say it's a problem, period. <laughs> um <laughs> It's um, it's kind of changed my life getting the diagnosis because I understand that I wasn't like inadequate. I think for a lot of my kind of childhood, I had these horrible periods where I'd be bleeding for like 11 days and felt like I couldn't breathe properly and was really tired and kind of look externally at all of my peers who were similarly having periods and thinking that like I was just immensely weak because I was so mm. like flawed by the experience um so to be told you know admittedly way too late in the game in my early 20s that actually this was above and beyond what other people were experiencing and that I therefore needed some follow-up was was kind of validating and simultaneously quite frustrating because you know, you know I had my first period when I was 12 and I was diagnosed mm. when I was 22 it was quite a long time spent um thinking that I was a weakling so during the walk for endo this year has come on the other side of a mammoth journey that really would be like a seven hour podcast so I will try and <laughs> keep it brief but it it came on the other side of my first round of surgery which I had in February to remove the growth that they could remove from my pelvis. They also made an attempt at removing what they could from my diaphragm, but it's a bit complicated and we are going to have to do a round two. Uh, so, you know, again, listeners, lucky listeners, watch this space for round two. Um, but by 
July, I was healed enough that it wasn't unreasonable to undertake this task. And Endometriosis UK as a charity, they do so much fantastic work. They do online webinars, they do live meets where they have um, a bunch of volunteers that you can go and ask your questions to. They support research and education because they think part of the delay in diagnosis is we live in a patriarchal society where you are largely gaslit when you experience discomfort particularly in relation to menstruation but also I think because we ourselves don't have the information like I I always knew I was having a period because my right shoulder hurt (laughs) Mm -hmm. and then only when telling a medical professional this several years later did I find out that's a red flag for diaphragmatic endometriosis because it wasn't something I chatted about with other people whereas perhaps if you know several years ago I'd have said to like you hey do you doesn't it suck that you always know you have your period because your shoulder hurts you might have said hang on a minute it doesn't sound terribly normal (laughs) yeah but um so the education pieces that they do endometriosis uk are really useful and i'd say like whoever you are whether you have a period or not have a look at their website because it's just having that knowledge translates into supporting people who are experiencing it and it mm-hmm. it validates their experience you can support them with a better understanding and it will hopefully deepen the empathy for those people who haven't got to that eight years haven't got their diagnosis or have the diagnosis and are now faced with like really inadequate treatment opportunities it's pretty much all hormonal or surgery and then when you start talking about surgery there's so many big you know implications of that decision and it is it is incurable so there is always the chance that it can return so it's it's a difficult disease to weather but doing the 8,000 steps a day has been able meant that I was able to raise some money for them which was great and I think for me I'm so sorry you're gonna have to edit this I'm like waffling so much no it's all good Um, I will wrap (laughs) it up but (laughs) I think for me my biggest takeaway from doing it was how uniquely fortunate I am to be so supported I had your support as a as a friend and also as a boss in the professional platform that you gave to the kind of walk for endo challenge which is just really really rare a lot of people with endometriosis are also having to you know fight with their professional lives to keep their job stay and work not like even be heard I re- I'm also lucky that like my husband he's really understanding and he doesn't minimize what I'm going through my friends my family like because it was a challenge but it also kind of became a topic in my day-to-day because I was like these are my steps for the day lots more people were talking to me about it and just realized that I have this like just immense network of support and in turn have had people reach out and like message on um Instagram saying like I've just been diagnosed can we maybe meet for coffee Mm. like I'm not purporting to be an expert on the disease but I can certainly speak to my experience and share that with other people so again if you're listening to this if you have any experience of endometriosis or problems like please drop me a message on Instagram I as you could already tell I could talk and I like (laughs) coffee so we could talk over coffee about anything so yeah so thank you for asking that that feels much more personal than my where would you travel in time question (laughs) well I wanted to give you the opportunity to talk about it I think part of the problem as you say with these things is it's just not discussed so everything kind of gets swept under the carpet and not recognized and it's just part of a greater like wider Mm -hmm. problem with like periods not even being discussed you know there's something that women like who are 50 percent of the population are experiencing every month and the knowledge Mm -hmm. around like your hormones and your cycle and it's just so limited and not just men but women as well yeah and yeah it's something yeah Yeah. it's it's a bad situation and one that we need to rectify and there's like you know women out there like Maisie Hill doing incredible campaigning for um yeah you know big up Maisie just, Hill. Mm. yeah um yeah yeah so Bloody let's good talk period about periods is another one if anybody yeah yes. yeah have a, have a look at their Instagram and the work that they're doing yeah yeah I I um I was listening to yeah. Jamila Jamil's podcast yesterday. I can't remember who she was interviewing, but they were talking Ugh, about periods. I can't. And she said that um 
in her experience of like chatting to younger people now it seems to be that it's like a lot more normal to kind of talk about periods like when they're going to the bathroom they're not like hiding their tampon in their like pockets and no one can see it's just like totally normal yeah. like to be talking about tampons to be having sex when they're on their period and to be comfortable Good. with like discussing that with their partners um so yeah I think uh, hopefully things are changing in those generations a bit further down the line but definitely for our generation if I can be counted in the same generation as you yeah. <laughs> then um we're oh, uh... absolutely we're 21 <laughs> aren't we yeah. <laughs> um yeah there's still work to be done I think yeah oh yeah massively and I, I think as well like within um I like I will always support and advocate for the NHS I think it is a fantastic resource we are very lucky to have I think the sexist element of medicine translates quite heavily into that delay in diagnosis for people mm -hmm. experiencing uh endometriosis and endometriosis symptoms because i don't think gps whatever their gender are necessarily well trained to recognize symptoms mm -hmm. when it comes to menstruation that that relate to endometriosis i think there's a big gap in awareness of illnesses that don't you know, only affect men. <laughs> okay. Well, to uh, deviate slightly from the topic of uh, endometriosis, although it's always a topic we're happy to talk about, um, my next question to you, again, slightly less personal, but I'm hoping will give our listeners an idea of who you are and how you live your life. Are you happy to tell us the best piece of advice you were ever given and why you think it was the best piece of advice? maybe how you've incorporated it into your life oh that's a really tough question <laughs> i said that about the last one so hard um <laughs> it's like oh i've got all these fun questions they're really lightweight <laughs> i think and i'm gonna have to send this to my mum to listen to now because i've referenced my mum a few times um <laughs> i think the best piece of advice that i've ever been given and I've spent many years not following it <laughs> but last year it was my like resolution that this was going to be the year where I start listening mm -hmm. to my gut and I don't try and yeah. override it because that is what I'd always done I've been like I've oh I've got this strange feeling oh my whole body's aching oh I feel terrible about this decision but I want to do it so I'm doing it anyway <laughs> and just ended up in all sorts of situations through my life that were just not right for me because I was like set in my mind on doing something which wasn't right for me but and my body was telling me no but I yeah. was like determined to kind of override it and and the whole time you know had my mum in my head listen to your gut Hannah um and yeah it finally sunk in at the ripe age of 37 and a few times last year, I made decisions based on, like, purely on, like, how I felt in my body. And they were the best decisions. Oh. And as soon as I made them, I was like, right, oh, yeah, I feel a hundred million times better. I definitely made the right decision. And since then, since I did yeah. it a few times, I've kind of got on a roll with it, you know. <laughs> I've, um, yeah, it's been easier to do. But like you know, setting boundaries and stuff. What Once you get it? on a roll with it, but you know, yeah, yeah. What was it that clinched it for you to be able to start actually listening to your gut then? Because it's difficult, and and like we are, we were you know socialized as women, both of us as girls. Mm -hmm. We are really conditioned to put other needs first as almost like a character of our gender. So yeah. I understand the difficulty, but maybe mm -hmm. listeners are struggling with the same thing. How did you? How did you do that? <laughs> I say uh, this, I might be me. <laughs> <laughs> well, last year was just like a bit of a transformative year for me. I came out of a relationship very early on in the year and immediately started therapy and I hadn't done therapy for a, a long time. So there was a lot of work to do and just a lot of introspection and time to figure out what, what my needs were and to start kind of putting myself first a little bit more um. to be better for myself but to be a better parent and yeah and that was just one of the things that mm. I knew I had to start doing because <laughs> I couldn't get away from it you know like if you make a bad decision yeah. or for me anyway if I made a bad decision and I was stuck in it then 
like my whole I would feel it all over my body you know like my I would my shoulders would ache I'd know that I'd made the wrong decision and it was I was putting myself through physical pain Mm. (laughs) for like you know for no reason really well you know there were reasons but I was just ready last year to make some huge changes it was the wrong ones yeah Mm. a big year the hardest year of my life probably but I've come out the other side and I'm doing pretty well so (laughs) (laughs) finally (laughs) so worth it Yes. worth it we love that yeah yes yeah cup north advocating for conversations about period and therapy always 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 therapy if you can yes. access it what a resource yeah yeah definitely and i mean i only really got to know you properly last year but obviously i've known you during this period of transformation mm-hmm. and just seeing like from my point of view the like I don't know I find you remarkable like your strength to be like this is the person I am and carry it through I think is amazing and what you are cultivating with Cup North and the the clarity of like your vision (laughs) I think comes from that like listening Mm -hmm. to yourself is why Cup North again I know I'm biased but why it is so unique and why it resonates with so many people because you're making something true to you you're not trying to Mm -hmm. like accommodate for a lot of other stuff you're like this is what we're doing and I really respect that. Oh, well, thank you very much. I, uh, yeah. Don't get me crying oh. now. <laughs> oh. um, but okay. yeah, that's well, really fair. sweet. Um, well, thank you to true. your mother, we'll say. Yeah, for thanks, the advice. Mom. <laughs> I finally <laughs> listened to you. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Maybe I won't say this to her, actually. I don't want her to know that I'm actually listening to her advice now. <laughs> Go with your gut, Hannah. If you yeah. want to send it her, send it her. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs>